So this is one of my favourite things, the compressed air pond system. Off it goes. At 2am, absolutely empty. It's actually been quite busy, it's just gone 3am and uh, I've just come back to the, the doctor's office to um, finally sit down and probably have something to eat. Um, I've just had uh, an urgent sort of bleed um, to try and manage giving some uh, obscure blood products and working out how to do that has been a journey and a half, but you are left to get on with it <laughs> as the night. I've got about seven minutes to um, eat my food before I need to go back and review a patient, so I thought I'd show you my meagre food preparations. Bavarian ham and mustard sandwich, banana, the best chocolate bar that exists in the world, some leftover sour glow worms, and a blood transfusion form, the most delicious sustenance of all. I'm playing mailman and delivering lot of samples to the lab in person, you can't send them by the pod system. This stuff is keeping me going. I've decided to come down and work in the mess for a little bit just because it's got air conditioning, which will be a nice bonus. It was quite quiet but it's now just gone five in the morning. We've got a patient who needs a new catheter and a full set of bloods, so that's going to be an interesting challenge for half awake Ollie. Okay, guys, it is 6 47 a.m., so very much coming towards the end of a night shift. Everything has calmed down. Uh, very briefly, and you can see I'm propping my phone up. I've got a mug behind, a jar of amaretto coffee, right here, right in the foreground for some depth. Um, but you guys have sent in loads of questions, so I thought that I'd take 10 minutes or so, just while everything is calm, to try and answer some of these, and hopefully alleviate some fears. The first question is, what age do you start on night shifts? Um, in theory, your very first jobs as a junior doctor, could be on night shifts and the youngest you can become a junior doctor I believe would be 23 given that you can start at 18 and it's a five-year program so I assume it's possible to graduate as a doctor at 23 and like I say it's it's very possible that your first ever job regardless of whether you're in medicine surgery whatever could be a night shift and is that a rough start yeah it absolutely is compared to, say, those of us that start on days with a full team, but you'll be great, you know, you'll smash it. It will be hard, but you'll start developing uh, quicker than the rest of us. Are you on your own during nights? This can depend. Um, it can very much feel like you're by yourself. And the first thing is to say that on nights, are you as well supported as you would be during the day? No, absolutely not, because not only is your own team not going to be here. So for example, I'm usually in a team of three or four junior doctors, a physician associate or two, registrars and a consultant milling around. Overnight here there is me and a senior house officer, an SHO, uh, which will either be an F2 or an F3 doctor uh, and a nurse practitioner who is very, very good. But we are covering basically all of surgery 
overnight um, by ourselves. There is a consultant on call, but we are the only people here to deal with things in an emergency. Although again, there are registrars and consultants on call for other specialties if we need their help too. So are you on your own? Well, I'm physically on my own and have been physically alone for most of the night. But if push comes to shove and somebody is really unwell, there will be somebody that I can speak to to get the help that I need. They might not be able to come immediately, but if I'm worried, they can advise me on what to do. Uh, someone says they're worried about not having the support of senior team members on a night shift. The thing is, right, is that at least in theory, especially while we're F1s and very junior, we are never meant to be alone and unsupported. There is always, always, always supposed to be a consultant for every specialty available on call. You are not going to be managing things entirely by yourself. You might be in the immediate circumstance if there is a big bleed and you need to put out a, a massive hemorrhage protocol or if someone is septic, you need to be able to do the sepsis 6. If someone is clearly in anaphylaxis, we need to be able to deal with that immediately. But as part of that immediate process, you escalate for senior help. As soon as you are worried that the situation could go south and someone is in actual danger, you should be calling for help and help will come. It might not be there immediately, but it will come. There may, of course, be very, very rare circumstances where help doesn't come as quickly as it's supposed to and people might get injured, their outcomes might be worse, they might die if everything goes really poorly. But from your perspective, as long as as the F1, the things that we have done are safe and that we've called for help and we've documented that we've called for help when the time was right to do so, that's ultimately what matters. What happens if you sleep on shift when you shouldn't? I think it, it is widely accepted in most trusts that it's acceptable for doctors to nap during night shift. It's a bit difficult because where I trained, there was an attitude, at least in the departments where I worked overnight, that it was unacceptable for anyone to sleep on a night shift. And so as such, I do not yet feel comfortable trying to sleep as an FY1. And plus I've got other things to do. I'm very busy at the moment with personal statements and, and doing my e-learning and things like that. So I've got plenty to keep me occupied. But certainly I know senior doctors can try and grab a bit of sleep and I think the general line is that as long as when someone calls you, you will wake up and are available to come at the drop of a hat, then, then that's okay because you could be doing anything else. But what happens if you don't wake up when your pager goes off is the next question. Well, then I think you'd probably be in some trouble, especially if it was something serious. You know, it's one thing if somebody needs a cannula and you don't wake up and that cannula has to wait for a couple of hours, that's kind of one thing. But obviously if someone has gone into arrest or someone is in anaphylaxis or someone looks really unwell and they need a medical review and you don't wake up for that, I think you're going to have some quite irritated people on your hands to deal with when you do wake up. Because not only were you not available to go and see that patient when you should have been and were obviously paid to be available to go and see that patient, the patient could suffer as a result of that delay in being seen. And third, whichever senior doctor is ultimately called to come and see them in your absence is not going to be very happy with you. <laughs> How do you deal with the uncertainty of the bleeper going off? That's a good question. Um, I don't have a bleeper as such. I have this, which is a, a decked phone. So unlike a pager or a bleeper, where it just tells you that someone wants to speak to you, we just have these phones so we can directly ring each other with a five digit number and that makes it much, much easier to deal with things. I'm a big fan of the phones and especially when you're on call, it obviously could be anything. Um, it could be somebody is really unwell and needs reviewing. It could be someone's blood sugars are very high. It could be that someone needs pain relief and they've not got anything prescribed. It could be a new patient that's coming and needs clerking. But you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the job, especially when you're on call. That is the nature of the beast and that is what we're paid to do. And, and honestly, very genuinely, the skills that you've got from finals, from practicing your A2Es, doing OSCEs, doing your clinical examinations and passing the writtens, you've got all of the knowledge you need. We will all cope. It's hard and we will be faced with stuff that is more complicated than we can deal with. But that is when you call for senior help. 
Lack of sleep and adjusting body clocks, how do you adjust to working on nights? I think for me the trick for nights is simply staying awake as long as you can after a day shift. So say I was working Monday as a day shift, I would work half seven to five or whatever, try and stay up all the way through Monday night into Tuesday morning, try and stay up until maybe five or six a.m. longer if I could, then try and get a solid ten or so hours of sleep through Tuesday daytime, ready to go to work on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. I think having a full day to adjust your sleep cycle is the bare minimum to what I certainly would deem reasonable. And it's doable. Um, I don't mind it, but I know some people it can take longer, and so they're pretty dead on the first night and get better as they go. Then when you go home after a night shift, different people do different things. I like to just crawl straight into bed and go to sleep because usually I feel quite nauseous after a night shift. But some people like to go home, have a meal, which would sort of be the equivalent of their dinner. Um, I don't do that purely because I'm so tired by that point. And so that means that I actually consume a lot fewer calories when I'm working nights. If you, if you looked at what I was actually eating, I'd be consuming far fewer calories but would tend to snack through the night. Some people don't like to do that because it upsets their sleep cycle. You've really got to find out what works for you when it comes to night shifts. Someone's worried about getting under eye circles. Um, I mean, these bags are Gucci. The thing is, is that nights are pretty infrequent for most junior doctors and you'll only ever do maybe three or four at a time. And if you really don't like nights, just try and put up with it, get through it go back to days. And there's a couple of people who have raised concerns about being being worried about their mental health, being on night shifts with um, with the rapid change in body clock and, and lack of sleep and so on. That's firstly very fair. Um, well done for being so aware of that, especially if you've got an existing diagnosis. You know, well done for for looking after yourselves. That's really admirable. The only thing I can say is that early on, you know, I'm only six weeks into this job as an F1, but given that we're on call during this time, I very much think that doing out of hours shifts and on calls is very valuable for our learning as doctors because you have to make a lot more independent decisions and use your clinical judgment and knowledge. But all of that said, it is very important to know, I think, and worth pointing out that nights are not compulsory. They are not deemed an essential part, as far as I'm aware, of certainly foundation training, and there are reasons for which you might be granted an exemption from needing to do nights. So if you have an existing diagnosis of a mental health condition or any other condition, um, things like fibromyalgia, chronic pain, chronic fatigue syndromes, things like that, or there are reasons why nights would be a really bad idea for you, or you have to take antipsychotics or other medications that have to be taken at a particular time every day and would make you um, drowsy at night or whatever, and, and any combination of these issues would make you an unsafe doctor or unsuitable to work at night, then don't worry, there are procedures in place to make it sure to make it so that you don't have to work nights. I don't know the details, but I know that they are in place. So if you are worried, raise it with your supervisor, they'll sort you out. So I hope that answers your questions guys, and I will get back to work.